in here. This is the story I don't want to tell you. It's a ghost story. There had been a sense that something was not right, but I kept that feeling shoved down, discounted as the normal anxiety all mothers feel about what they can't see. But then one afternoon, the ultrasound technician excused herself and left us in the examination room, slowly filling with dread, while we waited for her to return with the doctor. The gel cooled on my distended belly, and we said nothing to one another while I stared up at the ceiling and my husband looked at the wall. The door opened, and the technician and the doctor scurried to the display. The technician moved the wand, and the two of them leaned into the screen silently without changing expression. The doctor sighed. Well, you don't have an ethical dilemma here, he said to us. This is not a survivable condition. The baby died naturally during induced labor. That had been the least horrible choice. Rather than letting her suffocate in, upon birth or die in the womb, then cut up the body for extraction. These were ugly words, ugly images. It was an ugly reality that would not go away. After, we held her body with its long, thin arms and legs, her tiny head crooked into us. My husband held her the longest gazing down at her and disappearing into his particular kind of absence. You are still her parents, the hospital chaplain told us. You made the best decision you could for her as her parents. Then she left some brochures about a parent grief group on the bed and walked out of the room, quiet in her running shoes. We came home from the hospital with no baby. The next morning, our three-year-old daughter sat on the couch with me eating her breakfast, then looked directly into the air at something I couldn't see and said, goodbye, baby. For an instant, the air felt thicker. A week later, we went to a mortuary to collect a small white plastic box with a plastic bag of ashes inside. The young girl who greeted us in the lobby teared up. I'm so sorry, you guys, she said then told us the amount to make the checkout for. When babies are cremated, if they're small enough, the ashes are scattered free of charge in a section of the cemetery called Babyland. All the ashes of all the small babies free in the wind and rain, merging with the grass and flowers. The young woman told us our baby was just on the slight side of too large for that. We had no money for a burial plot, and so we took her ashes home in the little white plastic box. Friends came and went, bringing lasagna, soup, and pies. The phone rang, and we answered it. Then the house was silent again. We took our oldest daughter to daycare, then went to work, then picked her up again and came home and plopped serving spoonfuls of casserole onto three plates, one for each of us. Our daughter ate, and after a time, we did too. She needed to be read to, played with, bathed, and put to bed, and we moved through each day connecting the dots of getting her up in the morning, going to work, dinner, bath time, reading, and bed, then starting over again. The routine bore us away into the months, and when the ground softened in the spring, I planted a garden in the yard for our lost baby. I wanted a tree for her memorial, but again there was no money. After a time, a crabapple seedling volunteered in exactly the right place. It became a tree, and after a while, I didn't think of her each time I saw it. Seven years later, I found myself thinking of her while standing at the kitchen sink doing the dinner dishes. I pulled a long-term soaker pan out of the cold, soapy water and scratched at a crusty rime of enchilada sauce along the side with my fingernail. And then I glanced out the window to the dark yard, sensing motion. And then I saw the swing, empty, but swooping up toward the sky and back down again. The swing moved like a metronome across the moonlit crust of snow beneath the swing set on a windless night in an empty yard. It swung steadily, not slowing down. I called my husband over to the window, and we watched together as it traveled back and forth without stopping. Each time, there was a slight pause at the top of the arc as though the swing was gaining more power. Then it dropped back and down, then forward once more. 
For five minutes, the swing moved steadily back and forth, then stopped and shivered into motionlessness, casting a shadow over the snow. <laughs> 